In this video today, we're going to have a look at the Mutton Bailey Castle. So the Motten Bailey Castle really was one of the main defining kind of military institutions that came out of the early medieval period and actually survived for a long time. In fact, Motten Baileys were being used for hundreds of years. And there's a whole bunch of really good examples where the castles were modified and rebuilt and repurposed stone walls and bigger and better and more fancy I guess kind of battlements and defensive structures Tower of London and Windsor Castle. Rightio, so let's take a bit of a look at the Motton Bailey Castle. The Motton Bailey Castle is a really really interesting piece of historical development. To be really honest with you we don't know who actually invented it. There are some historians which like to suggest the Vikings did and their ideas were transferred into Normandy, uh, the descendants of Vikings, I guess, and places like uh, Denmark, which was obviously uh, a Viking nation, so to speak, as well as uh, Anjou and so on in France. However, other people dispute that. Uh, I'm one of them. It's very interesting. Um, there's a couple of really interesting debating points on this. Uh, I would argue that the, and a lot of historians argue, that the Motten Bailey Castle actually predates a lot of the bigger Viking actions, so to speak. Uh, a lot of people tend to say that uh, the Motten Baileys are actually a 10th century invention. So I guess that's a little hard to define because what you essentially have is a watchtower which is placed in an elevated position with a palisade, which is, uh, that really dates back to, uh, I guess, late Roman or post-Roman era. And you're bringing into that a small village to support the purposes of that castle. So you have essentially a small walled village uh, in what's essentially called a bailey. All right. Um, so there's a few big points there which are being debated by historians. Um, I think the, the Motten Baileys were a, uh, a response to Viking incursions. Uh, and I think that's well supported by many historians. Uh, but let's take a little bit more of a look at the Motten Bailey itself. The structure is essentially you have a, a mot, which is a French word, finds a mound with a tower on top. The purpose of that tower would have depended a lot on the size of the mound. So therefore, a bigger mound uh, would have obviously been able to support a bigger tower, which would have obviously had um, the capacity to run a whole range of functions versus a small tower, which would be built on a small mound, which would have very limited functionality. The, the mound obviously being built from soil and rock and you then have, um, as I say, surrounded by what we call a palisade or a fence. Obviously built from local timbers, ideally, not always. Uh, those, that palisade had uh, t multiple towers of its own to support the garrison. And you can see some very interesting developments through the years and stages of the, the Motten Bailey castles with some interesting defensive features such as hoardings and so on um, being used. But that came as a later period. You also have a large earthen ditch. Now, a lot of people today look at a ditch and think, well, I don't understand, I mean, how, how's that such a, a massive defensive structure? Uh, ditches, obviously, in the medieval period, 
would have been much bigger than what we see today. So for example, if you look at some of the um, Offers Dyke, for example, in England, then what you see is definitely not what as impressive as it would have been. Gradient, the slope on the these uh, ditches was designed to prevent people being able to ride horses into it. Most likely they would have followed Roman principles and had uh, metal spikes and this kind of thing inside these earthen ditches and that would have made uh, approaching the castle itself a very dangerous proposition. And most of these modern baileys would have had a, uh, a bridge that would connect them to essentially the outside world. I believe in the medieval period they would have been much wider and they would have been much steeper and they would have been much deeper than often what we see today. So these ditches haven't been maintained, obviously we don't really need them and therefore what you see really isn't that it's impressive. Some of the Anglo-Saxon burrs and Anglo-Saxon defensive grounds were um, essentially revitalised during the Second World War because Britain thought itself uh, very vulnerable to attack and so it looked to improve its own internal defences. Uh, but in, in, in the main part, these defences have just been, been left to, I guess, degrade over time. If a person wants to try and attack the castle, then you're going to go into that ditch, but you've then got this, this steep slope to try and crawl out of, and especially in Europe, um, I think a lot of it would have been quite muddy ground, quite slippery, that would have been difficult. Medieval shoes did not have heels on them like we do today. They're just a, a very simple leather sole. And so they would have been very difficult to get much traction with. So you would have been left quite vulnerable if you were spotted by a defensive person on the palisade or in the tower. You'd be very, very vulnerable to being shot at with, with bows. So there we go. We understand now the, the purpose of these um, dry moats. Now obviously there were also wet moats, as in moats that were filled with water. Um, that would have also posed their own range of unique problems to any potential attacker. Uh, and a lot of myth and legend being built up around them. Such as, you know, the whole goblins and trolls and all kinds of different monsters that might live in these, uh, these moats. Okay, so the mott. We know these, uh, these earthen mounds were anything between about three meters, that is ten, uh, sorry, 10 feet, right up to 30 meters or 100 feet. Now that would have been a monumental build back in the day with, with no modern plant, with no modern architecture. It would have been a very dangerous proposition to build something that big. The vast majority, around 93% of modern baileys in England only had um, Mots up to around about the whole 10 to 12 meter mark. But still very imposing from an attacker's point of view. You then have um, the diameter varying from roughly speaking 30 to 90 meters. So obviously in history there's been some absolutely monumental sized um, of these Motten Bailey castles. Now, if we take a look at some contemporary vision and understanding of these times, as I say, the size of the tower would have dictated its use. So, in the earlier period, you may have only had small towers, and they still would have performed a very similar function to the early watchtowers that would have been all over Europe. These early watchtowers had small garrisons of their own, sort of 10 to 20 people. They uh, would have had their own, a small supply of provisions, but essentially they were a um, place where you could base a few scouts who could look around the area and understand what's going on and be able to report back to larger establishments and larger garrisons of what was happening in the local populace. There was a, a very interesting 12th century chronicler who described the Mott and Bailey and he was talking about the Mott and he referred to it as three levels. He said the first level was 
largely for cellars and grain store, the place where you keep your large chest and all of this kind of stuff. Third to the second level being um, a large accommodation area for key personnel and the Lord and his family, largely living in a, 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 a just one basic room, perhaps divided by curtains and drapes. And lastly, he referred to that top level as being a, a base for watchmen and some of the other key personnel. So very much the, uh, the tower then starts to develop into, I guess, what we'd understand today as being a castle keep. And we see the development of its role and its function. When we refer to the bailey, now it's interesting because often these were kidney shaped. Often these baileys would, uh, there may be more than one, sometimes uh, two or three. And I think that's really interesting because you start to see that progression into a small self-sustaining uh, microism of the medieval society. Um, people being able to run small, essentially a hobby farm, I guess, uh, and the livestock and the... Um, grains and so on and the fruits that were produced within the castle would be able to sustain people in the event of a siege. We know many many sieges happened during the Saxon uprising and relatively short sieges but still uh, they were very much about uh, putting down the Norman castles. Unfortunately for the Saxons there just weren't enough of them and they weren't able to maintain themselves because they'd lost that um, central structure and central kind of command. So the bailey is essentially a courtyard and within the courtyard it has a whole range of different functions. There might well be a great hall, particularly in the earlier ones, uh, in the earlier Mountain Bailey castles. This would be where the Lord would be able to run his local governance, collect taxes, uh, plan infrastructure, that kind of thing that you'd We'll see a lot of today, I guess, within local government. You'd also have a lot of your trades and, and uh, essential people to maintain your garrison. So you'd definitely have to have weaponsmiths, blacksmiths, stonemasons quite possibly, carpenters. You'd have bakers, butchers, you'd have a whole range of cooks, a chaplain, storerooms, a forge stables and workshops, all the necessary skills and labour to maintain the garrison. Now obviously the garrison itself may well have been a lot smaller than some of the big stone castles that we see at places like Dover Castle and uh, the Tower of London and so on, but you would still have a garrison so there may well be something like 12 or 15 knights, so you'd have at least 15 to 20 squires, you'd have probably uh, 15 to 20 men at arms, quite possibly um, 20 or so bowmen and spearmen, uh, and you'd have a collection of different infantry skills as well, who would be there to um, defend the castle, but also be able to project that force onto the local populace when there were uprights. A lot of historians uh, do believe that the Mott and Bailey was, I guess, a response as the Carolingian Empire began to really break apart following Charlemagne's death. Empire itself was now starting to be ruled by a variety of earls and nobles and princes and different royalties. All of these had their own competing interests and a lot of them didn't see each other as being friends and allies. We also see that um, you have significant Viking incursions in the north and northwest of the uh, modern day France. You have Hungarians attacking from the west and other incursions is now starting to attack, come into the Carolingian Empire from the southwest. So, there was definitely a need within France to be able to develop some kind of place to project military force from. So places where soldiers can train, they can um, have their equipment and supplies, 
and be able to resupply places where you can store food and be able to uh, have horses looked after and cared for. So there's obviously a, a, a critical need here for the development of, of a Motten Bailey in the 10th century, that is the late 900s. Uh, so when we look at the, the Motten Bailey, we've already touched on a couple of the disadvantages. That being, it's made primarily from wood and therefore it is vulnerable to fire. And we know many of these castles were in fact fired by um, the Anglo-Saxons and the Britons, as well as uh, the Vikings and so on in France. Other disadvantages is that it takes a lot to maintain a Motten Bailey castle in that uh, if you're in an area with and you haven't planned the drainage then when you do get torrential rain some of the earthworks are going to be prone to washing away or degrading and therefore um, Potentially, if you have heavy, sustained rain over a period of time, uh, the, the foundations of the Motten Bailey could weaken or just fall apart. However, the advantages are that it's very easy to set up. It doesn't require a lot of skilled labour. If you look at a, a typical stone castle from the 12th and 13th centuries, you're looking at potentially 20 to 30 years to build one from you know start to finish versus just a thousand man days to produce a Motten Bailey castle. Now some historians believe these Motten Bailey castles could have been set up in really just a matter of days especially if you look at um, what happened when Duke William arrived in Hastings he set up two Motten Bailey castles within the first week. Looking at the, Mott, looking at the, um, the Bayou Tapestry, it's very evident that these Motten Bailey castles were actually built from the wood from his ships. So he wouldn't have had to go and harvest wood, he wouldn't have had to uh, do a lot of that stuff, he can just go straight into the build. However, um, I think it, it really does represent the, the speed at which these things could be uh, produced. You have a, a building which is, I believe, uh, a, a symbol of military power, a concentration of local governance and residents. Uh, it wouldn't have been much of a fancy place to live or anything, but it would have been a place where you can project power from and you could have a fairly quick response to local uprisings and, and that kind of thing and deal with these problems before they even started to take hold. You have a place where you can sort out local law matters and you can plan your infrastructure and your builds and that kind of thing. You have a place where you can collect tax from. So there's a lot of advantages with the Motten Bailey. The other key advantage is that if you look at the way that these Motten Baileys are built and the Tower of London is a fantastic example. Now I understand the Tower of London is, has been built and rebuilt successive times and a lot of refinement has taken place but it's a, a really good example of what today in the military and I'm, I was a soldier for 14 years but you refer to these as kill zones so if someone is approaching your Motten Bailey with an intent to attack so let's let's hypothetically say that you have a, a medium-sized Motten Bailey castle somewhere in the north of England, let's say York, or somewhere in the, the Yorkshire area, and you have a defensive structure of, let's say, 30 soldiers. Okay, now you're attacking with, let's say, 40, 50 Saxons. Human nature is to take the path of least resistance. However, with the earthworks around and skilled longbowmen, you should be able to repel that attack off. If those attackers get into the baileys, 
you have dedicated kill zones which are um, surrounded by fencing and structure therefore uh, the only way to get to certain parts of the castle is to go through these narrow focused areas which are going to expose you to um, military attack so the chances of even relatively large insurgency bands of Saxons being able to take on these Motten Bailey castles is quite limited and you'd need large forces of 100, 200 or so soldiers to seriously have any chance of taking on a Motten Bailey castle. Right guys, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe and share and I'll catch you in my next video.